Okay, one second. I'll switch you to phone. Okay. Yeah. So, Hank, first of all, I can introduce yourself for the audience. Yes. <clears throat> okay, my name is uh, Hank Reinhoff. I'm from the Netherlands, from Holland. I'm 67 years old. I'm still working as a coach since I was uh, very, very, very young. I was one of the youngest national coaches ever. Uh, I used to be an athlete, a sprinter. I ran 100 meters in 10.5, 400 meters in 47.4. I did high jump, uh, 1 meter 95. Uh, as a junior, I did a high jump, I jumped 2 meters. Uh, I wasn't very successful, but I competed for a national team, and I was three times national uh, indoor champion in the in the 400 meters, for what it's worth. But it's experience, so that's good. It doesn't have to be elite level, but at least the experience. And then I started uh, coaching myself, started to be interested in coaching, and then I coached the club. They did very well. The federation saw that, back and field federation, so they asked me to be a national coach for the juniors. And then I became a national coach for the seniors, for the adult athletes. And then I got my first uh, international athlete who became world record holder and multiple times world champion, European indoor champion in the 60 meters. And right now, after so many years, I'm coaching her daughter. So that's interesting. And if she hurries up a little bit, I can also coach her, her granddaughter. So, But then the <laughs> daughter has to hurry up a little bit, you know, make some children. Preferably four, then we have a relay team, so that's okay too. Nice. Um, nice. In my regular job, I have a small company. In my regular job, I test people for stress, fatigue, and, and burnout. I wrote a book about this. I'm lecturing. I'm organizing a seminar on November 4, international seminar. It's our sixth uh, international seminar now in Holland. I'm writing uh, books, articles. Uh, I'm a Considering most coaches, I'm a pretty, and especially my age, I'm a pretty busy guy. You know? Yeah, super busy. I wish if when I was like set 76, I'm as successful as you are, man. 67, yeah, yeah. <laughs> keeps me young to, to keep coaching and keep, keep hanging out with young people. That keeps you young. If you're only with people from your own age, you turn very old very quickly. So it keeps me young true. and keeps me thinking and adapting to what they think and their lifestyle. It's different from 40 years ago, of course. Cool. By the way, I love your book, by the way. Which one? The speed book? Yeah, of course, the speed book. Ah, okay. Well, it's an, uh, it's an attempt to, to um, describe my limited experience and knowledge about sprinting, but at least I'm using my own athletes as an example. I'm not using Usain Bolt. We, you know, we don't know how he trains. No, no, very few people know how he trains yeah. and what he's doing and why. But everybody uses him as an example, and I think that's wrong. I use my own athletes as an example. I know the context. I know their background. I know their history. So I can easily talk about it because I know them in detail. Yeah. So that's good. And the programs are programs of my athletes with all their mistakes and errors. And not the programs of Usain Bolt, because they only apply to Usain Bolt. Nobody else will do well on that program. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about it. Of course, man. So um, I'm just going to get started and, and ask the questions, okay? Yeah, right. So in Speedbook, you talk about like acceleration, mass velocity. So when you coach like acceleration, uh, can you talk a little bit about like certain things you're going to queue on, certain key point you, you're going to be looking at? Well, for me, acceleration, to start with this, acceleration is the most important part of, of sprints because you always have to go through acceleration. If you have speed endurance or you have maximum speed, you have to go through the acceleration phase. And the better this acceleration phase, the higher your maximum speed will be, of course. If you if you accelerate really slow, then by the time you got the maximum speed, the race is over. The hundred meter race is over. So it's the longest part of the race. It can be around somewhere between forty and sixty meters. So it's the longest part of the race, and in time, it's the longest part of the race. It's easy to train, relatively easy, and it's important for all team sports as well. Because in any team sport, be it baseball, basketball, uh, uh, football, soccer. You, uh, field hockey, you always go through this acceleration phase. Most of the time, the most distance is 15, 16, 15 to 20 meters. 
So, and it makes a difference between getting to the ball first or getting to the ball being number second, and then you have to run behind the ball. So acceleration is important, and it's I think it's easy to train. And if you train it and you do it well, then you have a great advantage because you have a longer and steeper acceleration phase, thus a higher and a later uh, maximum speed. And so the time to decline, to lose speed in the end because of uh, fatigue will be smaller. So there's all kinds of advantages of training uh, acceleration. Yeah. Of course, acceleration is related to, to uh, explosive strength, to explosive strength. In the beginning, you spend some more time on the track. The contact time is a little bit longer. So that's why very strong people like powerlifters, weightlifters, shot putters can be good at 15, 20 meters because they have time to exert their power to produce their, 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 their to use their strength and, and to produce power. But as the race progresses and you get further down, the, down the, your lane, um, the contact time becomes shorter, so there's less time to exert this this strength and to produce power. It becomes too fast, and that's why they start to fail. So maximum strength is important for the for the first part of the race, for the from the blocks if you're a track athlete, and then later it becomes a more explosive strength, as a matter of fact. Nice. So in order to like um, make the acceleration phase longer. Um, do you more emphasize on like power? Do you, or do you more or you utilize like uh resisted training, resisted sprinting? Sorry, resisted sprinting. Yeah, we use different kind of um. Uh, we focus on the strength part of acceleration, the 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 the, the, the strength part, um, which means, for instance, uphill running. If it's not too steep, if it's too steep, you better do squats in the in the, in the gym. But if it's uh, steep, you it should still anything you do with acceleration should still look like acceleration, not climbing stairs or doing squats because it becomes uh, too slow. Uh, because then you have an easier transfer to what happens on the track. You can, for instance, uh, pull a very very heavy sled or push a very very heavy car. You go. Ugh! very slow yeah, it's good for maximum strength but the the step uh, to transfer to acceleration is a, it's a very long step because it doesn't look like acceleration again you learn to exert strength in a very long contact time but in real life you don't have that contact time you have only very short contact time and that's something you don't you don't tr really train another one is so, so yeah pulling a sled Pushing, running with a, a parachute behind your back. Um, what else? All kinds of jumps, horizontal jumps, vertical jumps, bounding, box jumps, drop jumps, all these things uh, increase uh, explosive strength. That means basically uh, creating uh, or creating and processing high force in the shortest possible time. That's what explosive strength is. So it's related to time and to basically to speed. That's what power is as well cool so uh after acceleration we got max velocity so when it comes to like mass velocity coaching max velocity like you mentioned we got shorter ground contact time uh we got more chances to ex expose our athlete to a hamstring yeah. injury so yeah. uh, how would you coach a uh, max velocity well, the only thing to do it is by running at maximum velocity. Like running a marathon for sure doesn't help because you do using different muscle fibers, different muscles in groups, uh, different fuels, uh, different stride lengths, and different frequencies. So the only thing that helps is running at maximum speed, as a matter of fact, which is very hard to do because you can only do it every week and only spend a, a few seconds almost in maximum speed. There's always less than a minute because, well, it's high speed. It's very demanding for the brain and the body. So this is one of the problems. Uh, you do a, If we do a speed training today, like six times 60 meters standing start, that's 40 meters acceleration, 20 meters. It's two seconds, two seconds times six, 12 seconds of maximum speed. That's all we can handle. You then can't handle more. If you try more, you get tired and the speed will drop because your central nervous system gets tired. 
If you do more, you get tired, your coordination changes, and there's a risk of injury at very high speeds. The coordination is uh, is uh, failing. So this is the, and then the rest of the day, only 12 seconds every day, and the rest of the 23 hours and 59 minutes and 50 seconds, you don't do maximum speed training. So this is the, the problem. It's a, it's basically a time problem or a duration problem uh, that we that we are facing. And then maximum speed is very hard. Anyhow, speed is very hard to uh, to uh, increase because if you have a very gifted young boy, maybe uh, 17 years old, he runs 100 meters in 11 seconds. Oh, you're very happy with that. After 10 years of training, he's running 10 seconds. Well, he's 27 and running 10 seconds. You're very happy with that too. That's one second in 10 years, over 10 seconds, a scale of 10 seconds. It means 10% in 10 years is 1% a year. So the, 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 the ability to prove speed is a very, uh, the chances are very, very slim, 1% a year. And that's why you do 250 to 300 workouts. So calculate in each workout how much speed you can gain in the 100 meters. It's very small. And then either you do it or you don't. And if you don't, you have to do it the next uh, uh, workout. And if you don't, you're already in trouble. <laughs> because then you have to do it the next workout, make that little millisecond, almost millisecond improvement that workout. And there's no way to test if you did. You can't say, well, I'm, I'm faster than yesterday or faster than last week. How are you going to test that, really? The only real test is competition. Oh, yeah. so... So maximum speed can also be where we do use over speed, super maximal speed. Uh, there's all kinds of nice computerized systems, 1080 system, the Dyna speed is there. But number one, the very expensive, very, very expensive systems being around uh, sixty to $80,000 for most coaches. That's just too much. And especially when you're training a team of uh, 30 people, then everybody it takes two minutes for one run. Then you have to wait one hour before your next run. What are you going to do that one hour? And just uh, stand and watch. So it's not very practical. We use this uh, pulley system. It's a very old system. I wrote about it in 1984 already. Or downhill running. But then you cannot change the hill. If the hill like this, you have to do it this way. And often you cannot run on spikes. But there's some adjustable synthetic surfaces in, in some other countries. You can use the wind, but the wind is not consistent. The direction and the and the force of the wind it, it 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 changes all the time, so that's not very consistent to train. Fortunately, Holland is windy all the time, so that's that's kind of okay. But then still, and you can't control uh, the force of the wind. Sometimes it's a real tornado in your back, and then you're just over speeding and you change your technique. That's not very good. So there's different ways in acceleration. Look at explosive strength, maximum speed, only maximum speed or over speed. Sub-maximum speed really don't work. Uh, you can run a longer distance and make more volume, but it will only increase speed endurance and not really increase uh, speed, maximum speed at least. Just just to clarify, so when it comes like maximum velocity, like you mentioned, we should be always using max intent. So does that does that mean that we should always keep like do one hundred percent of like max velocity or like let's say ninety five percent of the sp our speed? Yeah. Of <laughs> sorry, just to clarify. Sorry. No, very good, very good. It's 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 hard to tell. The only hundred percent you can find is in competition. You always see when the athlete is running alone, or an athlete will run together with another athlete, or in competition they're running faster anyway. So I had one athlete, one of my first athletes, uh, was running in the heats in the World Championships or in the European Championships. Uh, and said, hey, go 100%, go full speed for a good lane in the finals. And then she ran and she had a good lane, but in the end, she ran much faster in the finals. So I said, wait, what was that? Do I know? You, I asked you to run 100%, you run 720, and then I asked you to run... 100% and you run 7-0 something. But, but that was a different 100%. So that's an interesting remark from an athlete. It was a different 100% and she was right. It's the effort you give, but there's always automatically when somebody's running with you, you give more effort. Even if you give effort, you give on 101%. Yesterday I had this uh, discussion with my athlete. So how fast should I run? She had to run 
100 meters, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. I said, well, an average, it was the first workout of after having a flu and uh, taking some time off for exams at the university. I said, take it easy, 90%. Because I know when I tell her 95%, she will go 100%. So I told her 90%, so uh, she always, well, what is 90%? You cannot really state it in just in time. The percentage doesn't really work. It's more a feeling than a very rock hard number that you give it at 95%. It's more a feeling or, you know, it's hard. What is 95% for one athlete is another 95% for another athlete uh, as, as well. So you have to know your athlete in order to say, okay, go your 95%. But at least it should be high speed. You should you should be able to see it if they're really giving an effort, if they really need control <clears throat> to control themselves, or they're just in the technique, leaning backwards, sitting, taking it easy, blue, 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 and while they can maintain their speed for uh, 400 meters, then you know this is not 100% or this is not 95%. So it's not really an objective uh, number. It's it's more uh, the eye of the coach and the feeling of the athlete uh, working in uh, in combination. Nice. So uh, the next thing I want to discuss is about like periodization, periodization for speed. Mm -hmm. And in your book, you talk about like short to long <laughs> approach or long to short approach. I know there's like many, it's kind of like basic comp concept for like sprint coaches or jump coaches, but can you uh, explain a little about like what is short to long yeah. and what is long to short? Yeah, of course. It's a, uh, it's a stupid answer. I know that it's not very uh, satisfying, but it all depends. Number one, it depends on where you live. Why, why do most athletes in the U.S., where do they come from? Or sprinters, they come from California, they come from Texas, they come from Louisiana, they come from Florida. You seldom uh, see a sprinter from Montana or Alaska. Why not? It's the weather. So if you have the opportunity to, in Jamaica, all year round, the sun is shining. So that's perfect. You can do a high-intensity work all year round. In Holland, in Sweden, in Russia, in Kazakhstan, in winter, it's minus 30, minus 40. You need an indoor facility in order to, to, to run high speed. And even then, the surface is hard and you get shin splints and Achilles tendon problems or hamstring problems because the surface is mostly made for competitions, for fast times, not for training. So that, uh, it depends on, number one, where you live, the periodization. Number two, periodization is dictated by your competition schedule. So in some countries, they're very fond of Sweden. They love to run indoors because from November to March, they train indoors in the indoor track. Kazakhstan, the same. They love indoors. So they compete a lot indoors. Well, in the US and Jamaica, they don't know indoors. They don't need to. So they don't compete indoors, 60 meters. And uh, so their periodization is very long from, from let me say, the, the year uh, starts somewhere in October. And then the training period uh, ends somewhere in uh, in uh, in March. So that's a long, long, long general preparation period. And they can because they don't have to compete. They don't want to compete, and they don't need to compete. Number three, it depends on the on the athlete. Some athletes uh, peak very early in the season. If a season in Europe, at least, is from uh, May, June, July, August, September, five months. Some of them peak in May and you'll never see them back with that time on the, on the track. And some of them, they peak very, 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 very slowly. So it's individual. Some people peak only May, nothing. June, disaster. July, they start to run decently. August, they're very good. They qualify for the World Championships. And in September, they compete and they're at their best. But it takes a long, long, long approach to, to be at your best. So that's something... You, very few people take into consideration. The whole concept of periodization comes from the 1960s and 70s from Russia, where they took the numbers and the performances and the training and the workouts and the training load and the volume and the intensity from a huge group of athletes and took the average. But we're not dealing with average athletes, we're dealing with individuals. Only when you have a tremendous group of athletes, you can work with average 
you don't care about uh, exceptions. I only work with exceptions. I'm happy with every warm body with two healthy legs is coming to the track and have to deal with that. So um, most of the time we're dealing with genetic freaks, which are outliers on the, in, in the statistics. So they will not respond very well to, to averages. So the whole concept of periodization is kind of, well, outdated. It's, it's a fossil from the 20th uh, century, from the middle of the 20th century. Verkhoshansky, Zatsyorsky, Matveyev, all the Russian sports scientists. And the strange thing is, after that, nothing happened. We're still dealing with general preparation, specific preparation, a period, transition period, competition period, micro, mesos, micro cycles. It's all from the 1960s and 70s of last century. Nothing seems to happen. Well, there's this thing from short to long. Normally, in Europe, we are forced to work long to short. If I look outside, it's maybe 10 degrees Celsius right now. So speed work is out of the question, real speed work, unless you have to have two track suits and dress very warm and three tights and, and a jacket. That doesn't... That doesn't uh, mean you cannot, that means you cannot sprint very well in this period. So we have to reduce the volume, uh, the, the intensity and increase the volume and increase the, the amount of repetitions uh, for each uh, run. So we, uh, eight to 10 times. Well, in, in, in summer, it's uh, three, four times at maximum speed. So basically we were, we were forced to work from long to short. Now, if you have the, uh, and there is something to say to do it. If you have uh, sun all year round, you can do speed work right now. That's fine. And speed is uh, hard uh, to develop. And endurance is relatively easy to develop. So you first build a base of speed. And then you do some more volume. You do some longer work. And then you don't need much of that in order to improve that. And you can do that before competition. With the risk, you're getting tired a little bit. And reduce the maximum speed a little bit. But that's in the hands of a good coach, uh, you hope. So it's more a theoretical discussion, and uh, 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 but by practical limitations. We have practical limitations to, to from short to long. Cool. And for instance, if, if you're training indoors, like Charlie Francis used to do in Canada with Ben Johnson, his athlete at that time, well, you only have a 60 meter or 80 meter track or in Sweden. You cannot run two or 300 meters because you don't have a track. You don't go outside in the snow, in two meters of snow. Indoor, you only have 60 to 80 meters, and then you crash into the wall. So you only do short, 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 short. And then in April, the weather becomes nice, and then you go and run 150s and 200s and 250s or 120s. And that works. So then you're forced to do, again, forced by temperature, go from short to long. But it's not a choice. I love this. I love your approach, man. I love how you explain uh, the concept of periodization and the limitation. I love that. But um, <laughs> okay. like you mentioned, when it comes to like, because due to the environment, due to the weather, you forced yeah. to work, forced to start with long to short. Um, yeah. Does like because you start long instead of like starting short. So, uh, how to like maintain like when it comes to longer distance? How to maintain the mechanic? How to make maintain the skill component of sprinting? Exactly. Yeah. What do you mean if you if you how to maintain that when when like in the, which case when the distance is longer let's say from acceleration to max velocity when the distance is longer and we yeah. start from like longer distance how to maintain the skill or how mm -hmm. to like let the body adapt to the skill since we start longer instead of like coaching by yeah yeah well fatigue is something that sets in automatically anyway or if you maintain it long enough if you stop at 30 meters you'll never be really tired from that one repetition. Of course, the next repetition will be tired, but not that one. Um, I have a bad experience as a young and naive coach. I believed other people, and it, it sounds logical. So my athlete was having, was very good at 60 meters and 70 meters, and then steep decline. She lost a lot. So, oh, it's speed endurance. Okay, we well, agree. It could be speed endurance. 
the ability to maintain your speed over a longer period of time. And um, that's where she lost. So what happened, uh, naive as I was at the time, people told me she should run war 150s and 200s. Okay, we did. She ran more 150s and 200s. And guess what? That last 40 meters became faster, three tenths of a second faster than before. The problem was she lost four tenths of a second in the first 60 meters. <laughs> so she gained the endurance part, but she lost in the, in the maximum speed and the acceleration part because the different demands of muscle fibers, there's more slow fibers and everything. So that was a good lesson. In the end, she lost one tenth of a second uh, overall because she gained but she lost more because of 150s to 200s. It's not acceleration. It's not maximum speed. And that was a strong point. So should you, it's always this eternal question. Should you focus on the strong points of the athlete or should you try to compensate for the weak points and work on that? Well, in this case, it was very clear. We worked hard on the weak point. It improved, but the strong points, de well, decreased. Well, so <clears> that... <throat> That brings that brings the other question, uh, on, uh, on the list I sent you. Is, I know it depends. I know the answer is like the the question is really huge. But how would you program for like speed endurance? Well, there's two ways to increase speed endurance. That uh, the first way is to um, run over a distance. Very simple. So if your event is 100 meters, you run focus on 120s, 150s, not 600s. It's too long. It's completely different energy system, different fiber type, everything. That's too far away. But 150s, 120s, 200s once in a while. Maybe if the athlete can handle it, 250s, but that feels like a marathon sometimes to them. The other one is just uh, run under distances and then repeat it for a longer time. That's the old Italian school system from Vittori and Pietro Romanea at that time. And it runs uh, four sets of five times 60 meters and three times of four times 80 meters at relatively high speed. So deplete ATP and creating phosphate. Then two minutes rest, walk back, bam, and go again. Not 100%, of course. That's impossible to do that volume at 100%, but at a uh, uh, very snappy pace. Easy, you work on technique and... Uh, back and back and back, maybe 20, 25 repetitions of 60 meters. And this way, they figured out you increase ATP a little bit, but decrease uh, creating phosphate. And that will prevent you from breaking down early. So you have more alectic fuel in your muscles. And that delays the building up of lactic acid. And uh, yeah, for them, it worked. It's just a lot of volume at high intensity, which always bring the risk of, uh, of injury. Uh, Low volume, uh, high intensity, hmm, okay. And uh, uh, high volume, low intensity, no. But high intensity at high volume, that, that's the risk of injury there, fatigue of the system. So most of them were suffering from chronic Achilles tendon inflammation and injury. The Achilles tendon is as big as your, your wrist. So that's um, that was uh, the backside. But from theoretical point of view and from practical point of view, it makes sense to do under distance. Well, here's a very simple uh, guideline. Uh, that I used as a child in the candy store. If you can make a choice, choose both. <clears throat> so if you don't know what is best, you run one time a week, you run under distance, and one time a week, you run over distance. So you got two speed endurance sessions in certain times of the year. So you can never go wrong, basically. Oh, man, I love this. <laughs> I love it. Best of <laughs> it's simple, world. isn't it? <laughs> it's best not rocket science. Speed world. training is not rocket science, isn't it? Yeah, it's basically simple. People try to make it complicated to make themselves interesting, to make themselves like outliers. I know I'm in the speed guru and everything. Uh, my friends, it's the oldest sport in the world. Everybody I see here walking down the street can already sprint. So, how complicated can it be? You make it complicated. We make it complicated sometimes. You just find something simple, apply it, see if it works. And the big question is here when should it work? If I try something new and doesn't work in one week, my athlete doesn't become Olympic champion in one week, say, ah, this doesn't work. No, no, give it more time. But you can't wait for three years or four years and to figure out if it works. So this is the real secret, finding out if something works, how it works, but if something works, not too long and not too short. And if it doesn't work, you discard it and find something else that might work. 
a very pragmatic uh, approach, I would say. There's not really a system. It's um, pretty much a pragmatic approach based on individual characteristics of the athletes and your own experience with coaching athletes. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, um, speed endurance, you do like under distance and over distance. So uh, yeah. is it is is there a like like when we train acceleration, we should we should shouldn't we should probably shouldn't probably go over like 300 meter or 500 meters so when it comes to like speed endurance when you do like over distance is there like 120 or like 200 usually like what is the total volume of hmm. the session for speed well, endurance? It, it, of course the, the, the volume depends on the intensity and the distance uh, 10 times 30 meters is different from one time uh, 300 meters of course um Again, uh, it depends if the, is on the on the uh, on the how do you call it the age of the athlete. When you're young, you have a good aerobic base for recovery, good circulation, good uh, capillarization, training the slow fibers as well, having a good endurance. Not only to not for performance in itself because it doesn't enhance performance, but it enhances recovery and keeps you healthy basically. So then, in the general preparation period, you make them run. 600 meters and a 600 meter 200 fast i mean snappy 200 easy 200 fast or four times 150 split it up for a sprinter 600 meters in the same pace at the same pace is just killing so you split it up and smaller 100 meter fast 100 meter slower not a big gap but a little bit faster and a bit slower just to keep their brain off the fact that they're getting tired so you can run six and five hundred meters six five four the man when they're getting older that foundation is there. You don't have to start each year with building a foundation because that foundation is there for already eight years of, of elite training. So then you skip the six and five hundreds. And on the recovery days, we do basically aerobic endurance work. It's the, the cross on the grass, the diagonals on the grass, you know, 10 times. And then uh, walk the long side or jog the short side it depends on the period and what's needed and so on and that's that's basically uh, uh endurance work not really speed endurance but it's endurance work as a foundation with a strong aerobic component and then for the anaerobic component of course you run 300s and 250s at high speeds it was a while it's 300 meters anaerobic not necessarily if you run it in uh, two minutes 300 meters it's not an uh, anaerobic event anymore you don't produce lactic acid in, if you run 300 meters in two minutes so it depends on the on the distance, not only on this, but also on the intensity of the distance and how often you repeat it. So it depends also if you are 60, 100 meter type or one and 200 meter type or even a two, 400 meter type. So uh, it depends strongly on the event, the 60 meter type, I will never make them run 250s. Uh, they will not come back tomorrow. Uh, so the more they need to train, but they won't, they won't see him back. I have this nice proof in one of my pictures i have this so oh 250 it went very well and she said never 250 again in my life so in the same diary she wrote it <laughs> then there goes a little discrepancy of what the coach found about this workout and the athletes found about this workout what they thought about this workout yeah. so okay so uh i know I'm going to jump in the next one. I know this is also kind of like depend on the athlete, depend on the coaches, but in your, in your experience, what like, what is the, what is your way to like, um, or what is usually your weekly layout? You find that that probably suits your, your athlete the most from like, let's say probably Monday mm -hmm. when, like when 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 is the day you do acceleration and when is the day you do max velocity? Um, that's a good one because they're related. They they demand uh, ninety nine to one hundred percent effort anyway. So that's not two days back to back. Most of the time there's a, an easier day where you focus on uh, technique mainly technique, doing drills, doing bounding. And then the next day we do acceleration or speed. There's also something like transfer or so. Or, or you alternate it, uh, basically. Well, speed kills. We know that. You can't do too much uh, speed. Independent of the weather, you can do too much uh, speed. 
And that's why I called something which is speed related. That's uh, exercises which is not speed training. If you do fast arms like this frequency exercise or reaction exercise or bounding, it's not speed. It's way too slow and it's not very specific, but it's speed related. Somehow it has a, a one component, for instance, for the brain, if you do frequency work da, 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 as fast as you can with your arms, with your leg, da, 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 the frequency work changes something in your brain, the rhythm in your brain. So it doesn't directly affect speed positively, but it's speed related. It's better than sitting in the chair and eating popcorn, let me say that. You know, so, <laughs> um, so we do a lot of speed related uh, work also. So uh, I would say acceleration in general, two times a week, maximum speed, maximum two times a week or in specific preparation period, normally one time a week. So then that's three workouts and then there's strength and speed endurance we have to do. And the whole comp the exact, uh, uh, how do you call it, dispersion of this depends on, on of course, the periodization where you are. Is it November or is it a March or is it in, uh, in uh, June? But this is an average two times acceleration, one time maximum speed, uh, two times uh, uh, strength, and then one speed endurance. And of course, some light work bounding is most of the time considered to be light. So we do this in the workout. For acceleration, we do the bounding. For the maximum speed, we do the frequency work. At, at, at uh, moving at high speed and the reaction for block work we do reaction time and block work is acceleration of course and you accelerate from the blocks so for block work to do reaction time for normal acceleration we do standing start or three stride approach and then boom accelerate So yeah, it's a, it's it's dynamic. This is the problem. People like have static numbers and static and want to have something to well it's like a Want me to cook your pizza? I'm not going to make your pizza. I'm going to tell you which ingredients I use and probably uh, how much. Uh, not too much tomatoes or became tomato with pizza, um, but it's according to your taste and to your needs. But you have to know the ingredients. Basically, all ingredients you have to know what they do when not when not uh, the pitfalls when using those ingredients. So more like a chef than like a, like somebody who's going to dictate what you exactly have to do. You have to think yourself. I mean, it's not rocket science, but nobody told you it's going to be easy. Nice. It's not. It's not. It's not difficult. It's not difficult, but it's complex because there's many factors involved. This is the problem. Each factor is well, starting from the blocks. How difficult can it be? Running maximum speed. Hey, go faster as fast as you can. How difficult can it be? But how much? When do you just stop? The training say, hey, four times maximum speed or five runs maximum speed is enough. Well, that's the experience in the Iowa coach. Because the injury and the fatigue come from the last repetition. So I prefer to have four good repetitions than four good repetitions followed by six bad repetitions where the athlete is struggling, is, is destroying his or her technique and where the risk of injury is. Give me the four good ones. I'm happy. Oh. Because those will bring you the progress. Four good ones and then... After like the kind of fatigue, you just cut it. Yeah. What do you mean? I mean after like let's say after four good like uh sprints or four good like uh really good mm -hmm. yeah acceleration you probably and as the athlete fatigue yeah. you're probably gonna cut it. Absolutely, and the quality is king and intensity is king. As soon as the quality drops, you're not training speed anymore. You're training speed endurance. If, if somebody if say, well, six times, 60 meters full speed. And after four times, I see the athlete is trying to teach and his struggle. I look at the, at the stopwatch and you, hmm, okay. Can you do one more at high quality and relax? Yeah, try. And if that doesn't work, that's it. Sorry for my plan. But we make a plan based on our fingers. We have 10 fingers. Five fingers in one hand, that's why I always do five repetitions or six repetitions or ten repetitions because I got ten fingers. When we were co, we always go for four repetitions, you know. So, <laughs> so <clears throat> it it it's just kind of arbitrary ten because it's a nice round number or twelve. Nobody does thirteen repetitions or seven repetitions because the number is nice. Oh, uh, although biologically it might be better than seven than eight or seven than six, but we choose the six or the eight because we wrote it on paper, right? We didn't do this. 
we did it on purpose, right? Six repetitions. So now, since six is on the paper, we should do six, even though the athlete tells you or your eye tells you and the stopwatch tells you it's better to quit after five. I got you. So um, when it comes to like, uh, like you mentioned, when it comes to like weekly layout, you basically expose your athlete two times ex acceleration and one time max velocity does it does yeah. it kind of like i know it, like like you mentioned it depends on the year it depends on the calendar yeah but yeah usually is max like max velocity at between of like two acceleration sessions no it's for instance monday acceleration wednesday maximum speed and then thursday again acceleration and on tuesday and thursday lifting weights okay because then all the systems and all the muscle fibers and all the muscles that you have been using on Monday, you will use them on Tuesday in the weight session as well, but in a different way. You're using different muscles, you different, different, you use them in a different way, eccentric, concentric, or isometric, uh, less explosive. So those muscle fibers that have been used on Monday, they can recover on, on Tuesday, even if you use them in a different way. So using other muscle fibers, as a matter of fact. And other muscle groups as well. On Tuesday, on Wednesday, you do the maximum speed work. And maximum speed, they like it because it's always short. You never do 10 times maximum speed because you can see from the stopwatch, it's not maximum speed. The last two repetitions are maximum speed, it's speed endurance. So if you, we always say as a guideline, if you, if things drop more than 10%, you quit. And for maximum speed, it's even less than, uh, than uh, 10%. So much less than 10%. If it's, drops two tenths of a second the athlete is struggling so yeah. the athlete tries to keep up the speed but internally they're struggling you're giving so much effort so they tighten up and everything they're giving too much effort that's something you don't want to see in the in the race because then you will get the same result running slower than you can because you're tightening up or trying to compensate for fatigue nice so um uh i know some track coaches gonna you like uh, there's a high day, high, low day, low model. So they basically put like acceleration after acceleration or after max velocity, they're going to put weight training, lower body weight training on the same day. And I noticed that you didn't do it. So is there a reason you so kind of separate it instead of do high day, yeah. high, low day, low? Yeah, basically it is. Basically it is. I would say high intensity, lower intensity. Even if the intensity of the weight training is high, the intrinsic intensity is <clears throat> relatively low. If you do three sets of eight repetitions uh, squat, then the relative intensity could be still be high or feel like heavy, but it's not the same like uh, six times uh, maximum speed 60 meters uh, standing start or 30, 40, 50, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20 or something. It's not like, it's not like that. It's a, it's the mental effort that the athlete uh, gives, and the squats go and go okay. But in speed, it's completely different. You need much more quality there, <clears throat> because they're getting stronger anyway. Even if the weight is a little bit slower, you make some more repetitions. Even if you do some more repetitions or some less repetitions, the the bandwidth in which you can operate to make athletes stronger is much more in uh, much larger in strength training than in speed training. In speed training, you need to be uh, maximum speed training. You need to have speed. If, if otherwise, it won't work. But in strength training, you can make people stronger. Bodybuilding, hypertrophy, recruitment methods, uh, whatever crazy method or uh, you can think of, they always get stronger anyway. You can't go wrong there. So yeah, we do. We try to alternate. You say heavy days and light day, but sometimes you give him a. You think it's a light day, and the athlete think it's heavy, or the other way around because, well, you don't feel the fatigue, of course, or something happened there. They just come back from an uh, exam on uh, on, uh, on uh, at the university, so hey, have a nice workout. The athlete's coming to the track from, oh, okay, man, my brain is fried. I spent uh, three hours in uh, in you know for an uh, exam on the, at the university. So, and then you go with the live speed trains and hmm, you change it. Maybe not. Maybe we do an easy training today and then you do the sharp training tomorrow when you complete your brain is recovered and you slept well. So, always take into account the context. 
and what you're going to always listen. We spend always one lap on the track, listening to the athlete. Mm. How you feel? What do you feel like doing? This is my plan. You agree with everything? Hmm. I have the feeling. So that's ownership of the athlete for the training as well. I'm not dictating. I have to listen to the athlete. If I don't listen, I'll be stupid. Because then athletes get injured or athletes, uh, they don't perform very well. So not the athletes always get uh, gets it right, of course. They prefer to do some starts from the blocks against each other than run 300 meters. I understand that very well. But that's something you cannot you cannot take as a coach. But in the end, you listen, hey, Doug, how did you sleep? Anything, uh, how was? How did you process the, uh, yesterday's workout? Are you sore? Are you tired somewhere? Anything, the orange light is blinking in your head, like, oh, my hamstring, my hamstring is um, not feeling so well. Well, listen to that. It saves you lots of trouble and lots of injuries, downtime, sometimes uh, treatments and uh, surgery, if you listen to your athlete. <clears throat> so it's dynamic. It's not like static. It's always like this. It's hard for, for me to predict or for the athlete to predict what I'm, what we are going to do today. It, it's just in... I tell them, of course, so they can anticipate. Some of them like to anticipate one day before or a week before. And some of them don't want to know. Say, so, hey, it doesn't matter. I'm always ready. So <clears throat> cool. it depends on the on the psychology of the athlete as well. Yeah, of course. So uh, the next thing I want to ask in you, uh, in the book, you're right. You, you kind of like uh, separate different phases in in sprinting so there's like a uh, block clearance there's an uh, acceleration there's a uh, mass velocity speed endurance yeah um uh and i also noticed that um you prepared strength training for each phase right yeah so can you walk us through how how did you pair i know like basically you already discussed a little about it but still kind of like mm-hmm. Talk a bit, little bit about well, like how you pair strength training to each phase of a uh, sprint. Yeah, it's it's basically very simple, Eric. It's it's like uh, it's like you have to look at the demands of competition. So starting from the blocks is from isometric, from a static position to concentric contraction of your extensors at least. So it will help to do this in training as well, and it's kind of a heavy. It's like pushing a car that doesn't start. You push the car. When the car is in static position, it's standing still. You push it, it's really heavy. Once it's rolling, it becomes easier and easier to push the car. You know, once it's rolling, it's very easy, as a matter of fact. So consider this. Where does your strength come in? <clears throat> well, when it's heavy in the first part. So maximum strength training or increasing maximum strength will especially be good for the first, for the block start and for the first 10 to 15 meters. After that, it, it loses because, once again, your contact time becomes too short to apply that strength. How long does a squat take? You take off in the squat. Eh, it might take one second, one second and a half if it's heavy and deep. So that's the time you don't have to your disposition when you're sprinting from the blocks. So maximum strength is related to start and acceleration. Second part of acceleration, let me say that it's a gradual transition to explosive strength because your short contact time becomes uh, shorter. So that means bounding, jumping, box jumping, power training, light weights with high velocity. Then uh, maximum speed is not directly related to strength, but more to reactivity. There's no time to push. So people try to push, but there's no time. <laughs> so you, it's like a rubber ball. You bounce it and it will bounce back. You don't have to push it all the time. It will bounce back automatically. So that's um, basically, again, jumping and uh, and, uh, and bounding with stiff knees. So you can bend too deep because then the contact time becomes longer. So it's with stiff knee, bounding. I measured everything, contact times, but even then the contact time is still longer than in full sprint. You're looking at less than 100 milliseconds while in bounding or jumping, you cannot go beyond, beyond uh, 120 milliseconds, 120 to 150. Even if you think it's short, it's really much longer. And speed endurance, if you want to do something with strength, then strength is not the, the best way to increase speed endurance uh, because you, with speed endurance, you want good metabolic system and open capillary. With strength training, you increase the muscle fiber and decrease the capillary. So... That's why uh, weightlifters, bodybuilders don't have an average, don't have a very good aerobic endurance because the 
contrasting demands on the muscle and on the uh, circulation. <clears throat> but if you do it, and then make sets of 15 to 20 repetitions, and the way it starts to hurt a little bit, where you produce lactic acid, sometimes knee extension, sitting knee extension or leg extension for one minute. Sometimes also a test of mental test and, and try to, well, cope with the pain that it brings. So uh, uh, double leg, leg and one, two, three, or one leg only. Okay, go, 30 seconds. Okay, here we go. And then the other one, 30 seconds, here we go, with a decent weight. And then the end, you see their faces and you can measure lactic acid. It's, it's a lot. But it's more a mental factor and a factor of, of mental toughness than, uh, than just directly related to speed endurance. It's a different uh, specific quality. Yeah, I like it. I like it. So um, that's basically all the question I have for you today. So for those who are interested in what we're talking about, where can they reach out to you? Which, sorry? Uh, Which? Where can they reach out to you? Reach out. Ah, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you can reach me. Uh, well, in, in this way, I'm on, uh, on uh, Facebook. I have an Instagram account. It's Hank Kreienhoff 5. I know it's a difficult name, but uh, Hank Kreienhoff 5, double A, I, J, E, N, H, O, F, 5. It's an Instagram. You see some of my adventures. Um, then I have a blog, helpingthebesttogetbetter.com. I'm a little bit lazy because I'm organizing this seminar. So, and I went for holiday uh, for three weeks. So I'm a little bit behind, but I'm going to write something uh, soon again about nutrition or supplementation or about training or some other crazy thoughts that are coming to my mind. Uh, so, uh, also, you can reach me at hank at fortex.nl. Hank, H E N K, not A N K. A N K is Texan. I Hank. <laughs> H E N K. At Fortex, and Fortex is written without the E, V O R T X dot NL. So that's my uh, email. And people can always reach me. Sometimes I'm busy, most time not. And for young coaches that are enthusiastic about their job and want to learn something, I always uh, make time. If you need some more time or have some more questions, then I'm always uh, open to that. If I'm not too busy, I'm moving from one office to another office, I'm having a seminar. Uh, my mom is still alive. She's ninety-three, and yesterday she fell on her face, and she <laughs> she's okay now. She's indestructible. So I have to spend time uh, there. Then I'm helping people from all over the world. But as you see, as your experience, I always uh, take my time for again for young coaches, for young athletes also. Nice, yes? nice. Thank you, coach. Okay. Hey, you're welcome.